this tutorial is um, about Flink SQL. It's actually um, designed to be a full day training. I'm gonna try to crunch it down to two times uh, two hours now. Uh, we're probably not we, we can't cover everything, but uh, the whole material and everything and slides and exercise, everything is uh, available online. So even if we don't, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're not able to uh, cover the whole thing, uh, you can still um, have a look at the slides yourself and uh, try to solve uh, the exercises. All right. Um, so I hope you all also uh, were able to follow the uh, setup instructions. Um, let me see. Um, so the setup instructions are um, in this uh, repository, uh, Viverica GitHub, uh, GitHub Viverica SQL Training. And if you click on the uh, wiki link, then uh, there's here on the menu on the right hand side is the setting of the training environment. Uh, instructions. Um, it's actually quite simple. It's uh, it's a Docker Compose setup. So if you have Docker installed and uh, um, have assigned enough resources, so you should uh, assign something around three to four gigs, um, then everything should pretty much work out of the box if you uh, bring up the Docker Compose environment. Um, all right, but now let's uh, get uh, get started. So I'm not sure how much you've uh, how, how much you've heard about Apache Flink. So I'll uh, give a very brief introduction into Apache Flink and then um, uh, move into the uh, SQL parts of it. Um, I'm not. Let me see if I can see the questions here. Yeah. So from time to time, um, I'm simply. We'll, we'll come over to this uh, to this window and see if there's if there are any questions, and um, yeah, I think it's also possible that you uh, enable your microphone and uh, maybe uh, talk to me directly. Let's let's see if that works later. Okay, so I'm getting confused with all these windows. So. All right, so Apache Flink is a distributed data processing system. It's um, a system for um, yeah processing large amounts of data in a parallel fashion. You can uh, process all kinds of data with Apache Flink. Uh, it's good for processing uh, real-time events, so streams of data, uh, for instance, uh, coming from um, um, log systems like Apache Kafka um, or uh, sensor data streams. Uh, but you can also process uh, uh, static data, like, data like, like files reading from a distributed file system or uh, reading data from a database. Um, Flink is used for mainly three different types of applications, uh, one of them being streaming, so-called streaming, or what we call streaming pipelines. It's um, basically um, yeah, a, a type of application that moves data from one system to the other, uh, maybe doing some, some uh, transformations, aggregations, uh, enriching the data, on, and so on, so basically something that you can imagine as being a low latency ETL uh, style of uh, job. Uh, then there is also analytics, both for uh, streaming and uh, batch data. Um, so just the uh, traditional, uh, yeah, but what you would usually do with the uh, SQL queries or machine learning uh, applications, uh, analyzing the data and uh, crunching it down. And then finally, uh, there's another type of application, what we call event-driven applications. Uh, which are applications that are basically, um, yeah, get their 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 data or the interaction through events, and then uh, process all these events. You can you can think of uh, like a event-driven application uh, processing order events, for instance. Um, Flink recently um, added a new API for for these uh, event-driven applications, uh, these so-called uh, state fun API. Uh, state fun API. Uh, my colleague. Stefan Even just gave a talk about this, so if you're interested in that, I uh, can really recommend going back and uh, checking out uh, his talk as well. All right, um, so that's, this is like Apache Flink on a, on, a, on a very high level from the use case point of view. You can run Flink on very different kinds of environments, like uh, Kubernetes, uh, Yarn, Mesos, uh, also uh, on uh, bare metal clusters if you really want to do that. 
Um, you can uh, uh, integrate it integrates with many many other systems in the uh, in the ecosystem. You can uh, store your data on HDFS, S3, um, Azure, and so on. So it's uh, like a full-fledged uh, distributed uh, data processor. Uh, Flink comes with uh, very flexible and expressive APIs. Uh, it guarantees the correctness, so uh, there is uh, exactly one's uh, state consistency. So even if one of your distributed um, uh, processes goes down, Flink guarantees that uh, it will uh, continue uh, processing once, or it will recover this task and uh, continue processing as if that basically as if this uh, error never happened. Um, it has event time semantics. We'll uh, actually have have a look at that uh, tomorrow a little bit. Um, and it runs at a really large scale. So uh, uh, we have uh, users that uh, run Flink jobs on 10,000 of cores, uh, managing uh, several terabytes of data. This is a list of some of the companies using Apache Flink, either using Flink for the internal use cases or providing services. Uh, or um, yeah, uh, computing services based on Apache Flink, for instance, uh, uh, Amazon or Alibaba offering uh, uh, Flink in their cloud cloud environments. Um, other users like uh, Lyft or um, uh, or ResearchGate or uh, Uber use Flink for their internal data processing needs. Uh, this is just a small, well, no, not that small, but uh, but a sample of. Uh, all the Flink users. Um, we are uh, running a conference uh, called Apache, uh, sorry, Flink Forward. Um, have run it for uh, like several times now, and there is a bunch of talks uh, that we recorded and put on YouTube. So, why would you like to use SQL for stream processing? Well, first of all, um, stream processing is. Uh, Implementing stream processing requires a certain skill set. It's not uh, that is not uh, that easy to find. So first of all, you need uh, at least for Apache Flink, you need um, a good Java or Scala developers. So Flink is uh, implemented in Java, so and integrated into the uh, JVM ecosystem. So you need um, somebody who can uh, code in Java or Scala. Uh, you need a good knowledge of stream processing concepts, like how to handle uh, how to work with uh, time and state. And also, since it's a distributed system, have some some uh, some knowledge or uh, experience in working with distributed data processing systems. So that's uh, actually a skill set that is, um, well, not uh, that um, that available uh, yet. Um, at the same time, see everybody knows SQL. Everybody uses SQL or has used SQL at some point in their career. Everybody who's working with data. Um, SQL queries uh, can be optimized and uh, are uh, usually effic uh, efficiently executed by the uh, by the system that uh, runs the SQL queries. Um, and if you do it right, you can have a unified uh, syntax and semantics for both batch and streaming data. And this is basically what uh, Flink is trying to build. So Flink um, Flink aims to provide a, a standard compliant SQL service. Uh, to query both static and streaming data alike, um, and of course running that on Apache Flink using the uh, correctness guarantees, uh, scalability, and performance of Flink. So um, let me quickly check if there's any questions. Not yet. So what is um, what makes streaming SQL different from traditional SQL? Well. Um, if you think about it, basically all query or most tables that you query with uh, a SQL query are, uh, are are changing, right? You have a have a have a table that is modified by some application with transactions, uh, some kind of order table where constant uh, continuously new orders are in, inserted, or um, tables about your customers. Uh, and the customers um, change their addresses or whatever. So basically. Um, Usually, database tables are, are are changing, right? And all these changes are basically maintained by the database. And whenever you run a query on such a table, the database system will conceptually take a snapshot of the table and run the query on this static snapshot. And then, once the query is done, it uh, gives you the result of the of the data uh, of the of the query. And this basically means that 
the input of the query is is finite. It's like some 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 finite amount of of rows, and um, since the input is finite, also the query result is finite, um, and it also never needs to be updated because um, you run a query over a snapshot of the data, and you get a uh, get a result for that. If you run the query later on the next day, you uh, might get a different result because the data was changed in the meantime. Um, stream SQL processors work a little bit different. S um, instead of taking a snapshot of, th snapshot of the table, these uh, query processors uh, basically uh, connect to the table, um, process the data, and they also process all the upcoming updates, which means the query is continuously running and it uh, receives all the updates that are uh, applied on the, on the original, on the source table, and then uh, apply the changes on the input um, compute basically the delta uh, on the on the previous result and then update the result. So you have a continuously running query that automatically mirrors all the changes on the input to the uh, to the output. This basically means that the input of a of, of a streaming query is is unbounded because you're continuously waiting for new updates on these on the source table. Um, but it also means that the result of such a query is never final because it might change at any point in time. There might, at, at any point in time, there might come some, uh, some row in, this, in the source table that uh, changes uh, just some fields or some, some rows of the output. So uh, the output needs to be continuously updated. However, you can, um, you can basically um, also show that the semantics of such a query of, of a query that is run on the static um, uh, snapshot of a table or continuously on a table um, are uh, actually the same, and we'll have a small small example for that. So um, let's say we are running a one-time query on a changing table. We have this simple table here: three fields, user, uh, some change time, and a URL, a click time, and some URL. So you can imagine this is some kind of uh, click stream table where every click that a user does uh, ends up being a row in this table. So we have this uh, table, user Mary clicks on uh, at 12 o'clock at noon uh, on, on some link, then comes user Bob, user Mary again, and um, at that point in time uh, somebody wants to run a query and um, runs this query um, saying, okay, I'd like to know how often every user has clicked on, uh, on a link. So what, the, uh, what a traditional data system would do, it would basically take a snapshot of this uh, query, would uh, run the query on it, um, and if while the query is running or after the query is running, a new row would be added, uh, well, this row would not be considered, right? So basically, um, the, the query would only run over the first three uh, rows, and um, when the query finishes, a result is produced, and that's it. Um, the query terminates at some point. The r result is final, and the input is uh, uh, is uh, con is uh, continue to change. However, the query was only run on a snapshot of it. If we run this query now on a uh, on a in a in a continuous way, well, then let's say we start the query at this point in time when the table is empty. Now the first row arrives. Um, the query ingests the first row and uh, updates the result. So. Um, at this point in time, there's only one user who clicked uh, some link, which is user Mary, and they clicked exactly once. All right, now the next row comes, and the query updates the result. The next row comes, and now here you see that we're not only uh, inserting a new, um, we're not only inserting a new row, uh, but we're also actually updating this row here, uh, basically changing the count from two, uh, from one to two. And at this point in time, the result of the query is exactly the same as the uh, as the query that we run on the on the same snapshot that on the snapshot that had this exactly the same data as um, the table right now. And if now we will, we are adding more uh, one more row, then this update will is also be uh, being reflected in the uh, in the table. So by this. Uh, Small small demo. I wanted to basically to show that uh, you can have the same the same semantics for SQL queries regardless whether you evaluate them uh, once on a snapshot of data or continu continuously on uh, new arriving data. 
All right, any questions so far? All right, then let's continue. Um, all right, so these queries were actually pretty simple uh, because I just used them for a, for a simple example. Um, but um, Flink uh, actually supports a fairly uh, fairly large set of SQL, uh, both on the streaming and the batch side. Um, on the batch side, actually, uh, Flink uh, supports a full TPCDS support, which is uh, TPCDS is a, a fairly well-known um, benchmark for analytical queries. DS stands for decision support, and the whole benchmark um, consists of uh, 99 queries, and uh, uh, Flink can run all of them. Uh, for the streaming, uh, look, looking at streaming, we we'll support um, the simple simple things like selection and projection from where clauses, select from where, uh, also supporting uh, different types of uh, group by aggregations, uh, several types of joins, uh, user-defined functions. Uh, we also support um, so-called over windows. We'll have a look at what that is. Um, if you're not familiar with these, uh, this is standard SQL syntax. So all of this is a standard SQL syntax. If you're not familiar with these over windows, we'll uh, discuss them tomorrow. Um, yeah, and there's also something uh, that is pretty exciting, uh, which is the so-called match recognize clause. Uh, it's a fairly recent addition to the SQL standard. Uh, it came with uh, SQL uh, 2016, and it's um, uh, it's an, uh, it's a clause that allows you to uh, evaluate patterns on uh, on tables. And uh, you can imagine that pattern matching and stream processing or, and continuous evalu evaluating uh, newly arriving data is, uh, can lead to very interesting, or can mean, means that you can solve very interesting use cases with it. Um, so what are the common use cases for uh, Flink SQL? Well, uh, I s told you a little bit about data pipelines before. So this is something that is uh, obviously a um, common use case for Apache Flink. Uh, because you can uh, use it to easily move data around. So you can uh, uh, read data from, for instance, from a Kafka topic and then uh, perform some uh, some aggregations and write it to a file or to a database, um, basically moving data from one system to the other and uh, applying arbitrary uh, transformations or uh, joining data streams together um, with SQL is uh, much easier than implementing a a uh, full-fledged stream processing job in uh, in Java or Scala for that. Um, the other uh, use case uh, is uh, analytics. Um, here, meaning that you're not not really moving data around, uh, but but mostly using um, Flink to uh, compute uh, aggregates or uh, or, or some kind of, so, so some other metrics that you're interested in, and um, then you can store the result of this query, for instance, uh, as something that is kind of like similar to a materialized view um, in, a, in a database, and then use um, uh, query the database to always get the latest result of the, uh, of the query. All right, so much for um, a rough introduction into what uh, Flink SQL is. Um, let's now have a look at the um, at the at the training environment, um, or at what we're doing in the training. Let me quickly check. All right. Uh, so, what will we do in this uh, in this uh, tutorial? Well, uh, first of all, we'll uh, run a bunch of queries on streaming data, um, so you get a get a feeling for how this works and what you can actually do with it. Uh, we'll uh, also uh, express like common stream processing operations like uh, uh, aggregating data streams uh, on time, um, hopefully also uh, getting to the point that we can uh, join streams together or uh, write some of these um, match recognized uh, clauses. If we don't come to that, as I said, uh, all the material is online available in the GitHub repository and you can uh, check out the slides and the uh, exercises. Uh, also after the after the tutorial um, we'll also um, write some of the uh, use uh, flink SQL to uh, write data to external systems so just running SQL queries on streams is, uh, is is fun but when you actually want to do something with it you kind of like have to 
materialize your results somewhere. And uh, we'll do that with uh, Apache Kafka. So writing uh, the result of a streaming query back into Kafka or into MySQL. Uh, and then we'll use Flink's CLI client, SQL CLI client, uh, for all of the exercises in the tutorial. We're using um, a scenario here, which is based on um, taxi ride data. So this is, this is a, a public data set uh, that um, basically uh, provides uh, data about taxi rides in New York City. Um, we're using this as a yeah, basically as a scenario to run off some of the queries to make it a little bit more meaningful, interesting. We split the data up into three different tables. There's a rides table that uh, contains uh, one start and one end event for every uh, taxi ride that happened. So when the taxi ride starts, there's an event going into the rides table that says, uh, this, um, this is the time, this is the uh, coordinates, longitude and latitude, uh, this is how many passengers we, uh, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, moving with this ride. Uh, and then there's also an end event that says, okay, the ride ended uh, at this uh, location at this time. So every ride has uh, two, is represented as two uh, different events. Then there is a fares table, uh, which has one payment event for each ride, which happens um, shortly before the end of the, uh, the ride. And then there's another table, driver changes, which has one event uh, for every time when a taxi is used by another, by a different driver. So basically we're, we're capturing here whenever a yeah, uh, taxi is uh, used by a different driver. So all of these tables are already uh, registered and uh, available for, uh, for uh, immediate uh, use in, in our training environment, so there's no need for you to define these tables. Um, and each of these tables is uh, backed by uh, a Kafka topic. So you can imagine uh, that there is uh, some process pushing data into these tables. And um, what you uh, see in the CLI client is uh, basically all the data that was pushed into these uh, Kafka topics. Here's uh, some, some sample data. So if you run the simple select star query uh, from writes, you'll get a result that looks like this. So you see there's an ID for a write, there's a taxi ID, uh, basically yeah, the car that uh, did, the, uh, did the write uh, is start. Here is a Boolean variable that says true if it's in a start event, uh, longitude, latitude, time, and passenger count. For the fares table, it looks uh, quite similar. We have the ride ID. Basically, you want to know for which ride somebody paid. Uh, there's the time when the payment happened. There's the payment met method here. Yeah, this uh, CSH means cash, I guess. Uh, uh, amount of tip, tolls, and fare. Um, and then there's these, uh, this driver change table where we have a taxi ID, the drive ID, and when the, uh, the timestamp when the user, when the driver started using the, the, the taxi. Um, the training environment that we will use is based on Docker Compose. So each of the uh, colored boxes here basically uh, corresponds to a Docker container. We have a Docker container for the uh, uh, CLI client. Uh, this is the container that we basically use to run our queries. When you submit a query, it basically gets submitted to uh, Job Manager. Job Manager is a component of Apache Flink, which is the uh, uh, yeah, the master node um, of uh, of Apache uh, Flink. Um, there is a web front end that you can access when everything's running here. It's on localhost 8081. Um, and then there's the task manager um, component. F uh, Flink cluster can have one or more task managers. Task managers are, uh, are the workers that are executing the tasks. And um, basically, when you submit a query to the job manager, it uh, breaks the job down into, sub, um, into multiple tasks and distributes them to the task managers for execution. Um, there's a container for Apache Kafka because we use Apache Kafka as a, as a data source here. The SQL CLI client has actually two roles. It's not only uh, there for running the CLI, but it also continuously pushes data into Apache Kafka. Uh, at 10x speed here basically means that it pushes data um, 
with 10 times the um, timestamp uh, timestamp speed, basically, if you see here, two timestamps. Okay, they have all the time, all the same timestamps, but if you have uh, see here two timestamps here, then you basically um, um, this is at uh, 36 seconds, and this is at one minute and one. Uh, there's like roughly 30 seconds in between uh, these two events. Uh, but uh, to make the whole uh, environment a little bit more interesting, we actually push them only two seconds, uh, three seconds apart from each other, so to just get a little bit more data, because this is a real data set, and just looking at it uh, at uh, regular speed would uh, be a little bit boring. Um, yeah, then there's a small Zookeeper node, which is uh, uh, at this point still needed by Kafka. They are currently working on getting uh, getting rid of the Zookeeper dependency. And then there's also a, uh, a small MySQL container that we'll uh, use to push data into. Okay, so um, as I said, we're gonna we're going to run the queries uh, using the uh, Flink CLI client. This is um, a component that comes with Apache Flink. Um, and here are two screenshots, so you can get a rough rough idea how it looks. It's just a regular SQL CLI. Um, and uh, the Flink CLI client has uh, two modes of executing queries. Um, the first one is the so-called um, interactive query submission mode. Um, here, you basically, the user enters a query, uh, submits the query to the uh, CLI. Uh, the SQL client has, uh, has a catalog embedded, uh, has an optimizer also embedded. Uh, and the optimizer uh, optimizes the query and submits the resulting uh, job to the Flink cluster. And then the Flink cluster will start accessing the, uh, the data or reading the data from the, from the tables that were referenced in the query. Um, the data goes into the uh, query, and the data goes into the query that's running in the Flink cluster. And then Flink feeds the results back into the, the SQL CLI client, and the CLI displays the uh, the results. So this is the interactive mode. So you basically run the queries and you directly see the uh, results interactive in the CLI client. Um, and there's another mode um, when you're submitting a query as a using the insert into um, syntax. This basically means that you want to write the result into some other table. Uh, at that, uh, if, if you do that, the query is uh, again optimized by the SQL CLI client uh, but, and submit to the Flink cluster. But here, the result of the query is basically fed back into the system that uh, holds the sync table. And um, the SQL CLI client doesn't get any of the results back. It only gets um, back a message that uh, the query was submitted, and this is the uh, ID of the query. And then you can uh, look up the query in the, uh, in the Flink web UI. All right, so much for um, the uh, introduction. Let's now uh, try to uh, get our hands a little bit dirty uh, and uh, work with the actual thing. Um, I have to admit I've never done a, a virtual tutorial uh, before, so usually this would be the time when uh, uh, you guys uh, start uh, coding and uh, working, and whenever you have a question, you raise your hand, and I uh, come, your, come to your uh, uh, to your uh, desk, and then you uh, ask me a question. So I'm not quite sure how we should do it. I would say maybe I'll uh, walk you through the exercises, and whenever something is unclear, you'll uh, ask a question, and uh, um, I'm going slow, so you have a chance to also um, do some things on your own. Let's just start the the environment. So I'm. Let me increase the font size a little bit. Um, so I'm bringing up the Docker Compose environment. Now all the uh, containers are being started. And now I basically enter the SQL CLI client 
by running this command. It basically runs this shell script in the SQL uh, C-like container. And here you see that we have this nice squirrel here for the SQL C-like client. All right, let's first check uh, which, which, which tables are available. So we'll just say show tables. And you see those are the three tables that we actually um, already talked about. You can uh, describe a table, let's say the rights table, and uh, get uh, some, some information about the schema here. You see uh, write ID, text ID, and so on. Uh, write time here is a, kind of like a special column. It's a so-called row time column, uh, which uh, we will use tomorrow when we talk about um, queries and time. Uh, this is basically uh, somewhat uh, corresponding to, a, to the event time attribute that you uh, get when you use uh, the Flink data stream API. So if you have, have done that before, if not, don't worry about it yet. Uh, we'll come to that later. So we can now, let's say, run a simple query on this table. And um, yeah, when I start, basically start at the uh, command line client or the, the Docker Compose environment, um, the uh, SQL CLI container started pushing data into uh, the Apache Kafka topic. And this is still happening uh, now. So we're basically still reading the data that is being pushed to Apache Kafka. So you see it's continuously adding more data. It's not like reading a lot of data uh, from this Kafka topic and still being uh, uh, displaying it, but actually the data is fed into the Kafka topic uh, right at this point in time. So usually this uh, interactive session is meant that you like become familiar with the, uh, with the environment here. Um, so we've done that, select star from rights. Uh, there's also a bunch of SQL functions already available. We say show functions. Uh, this is basi basically the list of all functions that are uh, built into Apache Flink. Um, yeah, this is the this list of uh, list of built-in functions. And um, in addition to that, there's also a few um, user-defined functions that we implemented here uh, that make it easier to uh, to work with uh, some of the data. Like for instance, a time diff function that uh, takes two timestamps and then basically returns the difference uh, of the timestamps in milliseconds. There is this um, is in uh, NYC function where you uh, pass the longitude into the latitude uh, and the function will basically tell you whether uh, this uh, location is roughly in the uh, New, York, New York City area. Um, two functions to area ID uh, where um, longitude and latitude coordinates are mapped into a, a grid of cells, each cell being roughly 100 by 100 meters. We're going to use that to later aggregate on this uh, on this area ID, and also the inverse function, the two coordinates function, where you basically pass the area ID, and then it will uh, return the center of the of, of the cell. Um, yeah, and then there's also this driver function. So I'm not going to talk about this now. It's uh, mostly important for some of the joining exercises later. Uh, Flink also support, or the CLI client also supports uh, creating views, so you can pretty easily um, um, implement views like this. This now creates a view, right starts, uh, where we only have the writes that uh, the the right events that are right start events. So we can now select from right starts, um, and just as you would expect. Now we get all the starting events. You see the start flag is, uh, is always true. Um, not that exciting, to be honest. Um, all right, I think we can um, 
skip the exercises uh, here. That's mostly for um, for defining views. So here's a, um, an exercise. This task is to ex uh, the task of this exercise is to cleanse the tables of write events by removing events that do not start or end in New York City. Uh, for this, we would basically use the um, the is in NYC uh, user defined function and then uh, call the function with the uh, coordinates um, with the start or end co end coordinates of um, the uh, of the event and then filter on filter on the result and only letting those through that are actually in in New York City so it's fairly simple select statement here all right so um yeah what we've done so far was yeah fairly uh, fairly simple simple very basic uh, SQL stuff nothing exciting yet uh, but uh, yeah you just got an basically an idea of um how these uh, how how this training environment looks like and what it means to or yeah how how it feels to run simple queries on data streams so um in flink or the uh, like the underlying concept in flink that uh, that flink uses for for running continuous sql queries uh, is a so called dynamic table and um a dynamic table is uh, basically what the name suggests it's a table that is uh changing over time that is evolving um as i said before basically every table is uh, is changing but usually this is not exposed to the to the query right because when you run a query uh, the database is, uh, database system takes a snapshot um using techniques like um uh, yeah this this uh, isolation and transactions to actually make sure that uh, you only get a consistent view of the data um but um um, the, the, the query itself only sees a static data set. Um, in contrast, when you're running a continuous query in Flink, uh, you're running the query on a dynamic table, and uh, the query itself uh, in internally needs to use needs needs to have some 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 state to hold intermediate results, um, and then um, the output of such a, a query is again a dynamic table. Um, a dynamic table can uh, get its data uh, through different kinds of uh, connectors. Uh, Flink has a, has, a, has a bunch of connectors. It has a, a, a Kafka uh, connector for uh, Apache Kafka. You can also read data uh, via a JDBC uh, driver. So there's actually uh, many more databases that you can access than just Postgres and MySQL. Every uh, database that has uh, uh, has a JDBC connector. It also uh, works with different file systems like HDFS or S3, and then again can materialize the result of a query, uh, which is represented internally again as a dynamic table. Also to all these different kinds of systems. Um, something that's uh, important to uh, to understand is that the dynamic table is not necessarily something that is materialized uh, within Apache Flink. So it's uh, first of all, it's a more or less of a conceptual uh, conceptual thing here. Uh, it does not mean that Flink fully materializes or uh, a, a copy of the of the input data. Um, there is sometimes, depending on the on the uh, data and depending on the on the on the query. Um, uh, some or all of the table data needs to be materialized, but this is not true for all all queries. There is uh, also many queries that uh, materialize only a small small portion uh, of the dynamic table uh, in state and uh, can be therefore be executed quite uh, quite efficiently. Um, it's also important to note that um, the Flink community continuously uh, uh, works on improving the connectors and also adding new connectors to different systems. So. Um, and this is something that is, uh, has become uh, yeah, a little bit of a focus now, uh, also to make it easier to connect uh, different systems uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this infrastructure. So um, if you look at this, basically there's, you, can, you can think of uh, the uh, query processing like in three different steps. The first step is basically getting data into, uh, into Apache Flink 
you can think of li it like basically converting the data that comes from Kafka uh, to a concept conceptual to a dynamic table. As I said before, it's not necessarily materialized, but conceptually, there's a um, conversion step from from these source systems to dynamic table. Then there is the query execution that uh, gets the dynamic uh, the table from the dynamic table and uh, computes it uh, to a new dynamic table. Then there is the output step when uh, the dynamic table now needs to be uh, written to a sync system. So there's the um, ingestion step, there's the processing step, and then there's the uh, uh, output step. Um, right now, for this uh, stream or for this uh, input to dynamic ta table conversion, Flink in the current version, Flink uh, 110, only supports the uh, uh, insert mode or or append mode. Uh, which basically means that all records that are uh, pushed to Flink are uh, interpreted as insert, uh, as uh, records that are inserted into a table. So, for instance, if this uh, stream of events comes from Apache Kafka, um, then each of these uh, uh, events would correspond to a new row uh, in this table. Uh, this means, of course, that this table is ever growing, and the more data that is is added to this uh, table, on the uh, conceptual dynamic table is uh, is 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 growing uh, more and more. And uh, if you think about that and have a high volume stream, um, then this is uh, also a clear indication that Flink is not, would not even be able to materialize such a such a table uh, internally instead, because it would over time just grow too large. Um, however, as I said, so this is currently the only uh, only way to get data into uh, or convert a, um, external data into a dynamic table, uh, interpreting all of the rows as insert statements. Uh, for the upcoming release, Flink one, whoops, uh, Flink one eleven, um, the community worked on. Um, Work on a, a mode that can also ingest uh, full change logs, and uh, for instance, uh, can convert uh, Debezium change logs into dynamic tables. So you can basically um, connect, um, for instance, if you're uh, extracting a Postgres logs or the, a Postgres converting a Postgres table into a change log using using Debezium, um, you could. Uh, um, basically connect the uh, Debezium change log to Apache Flink and then have a dynamic table that exactly mirrors um, the uh, table in, in Postgres and then run queries on uh, on this table. And when something is changed in uh, in the Postgres table, the uh, change log would forward this change into Apache Flink. Apache Flink would pick up this change, apply it uh, on, the, on, the, on the query and uh, emit the result. Um, so now you basi we basically have this conceptual, this dynamic table in Apache Flink, and uh, we can run some queries on uh, on it. And um, these tables can be queried just with regular SQL, so there is no, uh, not really special syntax required. There is, uh, there are a few like special, uh, how to say that. Uh, Patterns, I would say, it's still it, it is standard SQL, but it's a it's a certain certain, certain patterns that you, patterns that you use later if we're handling with uh, uh, temporal conditions. So we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. Uh, but uh, the the syntax is uh, uh, all uh, standard compliant SQL syntax. And um, when such a query is continuously started, then the results are. Uh, as I said, incrementally computed and updated. So let's have a look at what that means for a with a simple example. So again, we have uh, have a have a have this clicks table here on the left hand side um, with a user click table URL, and we are running a simple filter query on uh, on this uh, on this table. Then uh, we we're just checking for URLs that uh, uh, access this home home URL. Then uh, the first record accesses exactly that URL, so that's why it passes. The next one doesn't, and so on. And you see that um, this is a very simple query that 
basically also means uh, that this query, that the result of this uh, query uh, will result in a table that is uh, also append only. So at any point in time, we can make for every record, we can make a decision uh, whether this uh, record is uh, part of the result or not. And once we made the decision, there's no reason to really uh, change the result of this because the query doesn't change and the row doesn't change. So um, all uh, all updates here in the result table are always um, append only. This is also a good example, for instance, for a query um, that would not need to materialize any of the input data, right? You can imagine that this clicks table is uh, conceptually super large, but uh, Flink does not, doesn't need to materialize any of the rows. Uh, so the dynamic table would basically not be materialized for this query. We can just apply a, uh, a simple the, the the simple filter on the fly, and uh, not need to materialize any of the any of the data. Um, if we run a different query, so this is the query that uh, we had in our other example before, uh, or a similar query. Um, we basically have an aggregation query now. And if we run the query, we basically the uh, result table gets updated. And um, here you basically see that the rows of the result table need to be retracted. So we need to um, uh, to update some of the rows that we already emitted and uh, change them if, uh, whenever we uh, when we see new data. So this the behavior of this query um, is uh, is different in this in this regard to the other one because we um, need to change some of the results that we already emitted. Um, so now coming back to the uh, to the last let me first check if there's any questions no um, so um, if we know uh, now the last part of the query execution is then basically converting the uh, dynamic table back uh, to the output system. And um, there's also different modes how uh, how this can be done. And it pretty much depends on whether the result table needs to be updated or not. Um, because if the, if the result table has updates, they kind of like need to be somehow encoded into the outgoing stream. And there's different ways how Flink can do that. Um, the first case is the uh, is the simple case where the uh, result of a of a of a query uh, like this simple um, filter query is an insert only stream. In this case, it's um, the conversion is very is just exactly the same as uh, as before as for for the append only or insert only uh, ingestion. Uh, in this case, basically each row that passes the uh, that is produced for by the query is just uh, uh, passed on as an insertion record, and the downstream system can just write out all of these uh, uh, rows that it receives because uh, it knows none of these rows ever needs to be updated again. So this is something that we can use to write data to an Apache Kafka topic uh, into some kind of file, um, but also to other more uh, uh, other data stores that allow more data, more um, um, update modes like um, Elasticsearch, a key value store, or a, a regular database. So this is uh, the kind of like the easiest output mode because we can just uh, continuously write data out and never need to update anything. If, however, um, the query looks like this, it is some kind of aggregation query that also needs to update some of the results, um, then all these changes can be converted into uh, insertion and deletion um, statements. So for instance, if you look at the at the third record here, where we get the second uh, value for Mary, at this time, when, we, when the query is processing this record, we need to basically uh, remove the previous or the previous result for Mary, which means we here the minus indicates that we delete this record. So before we for the first record we inserted Mary with a count of one, then we get the next record for Bob, added this one uh, with a count of one, and then we get the next record for Mary. Uh, so we need to update the count, and we do this by 
first deleting this and the, our previous result and then inserting a new one. So um, this basically means that this kind of uh, conversion mode needs um, uh, some external system that is able to uh, delete uh, arbitrary records. Um, this is not very easy if you if you want to do that on a file system. It's not usually not not efficient because if you're writing data out, for instance, in some kind of um, format like Parquet or uh, ORC, um, these formats are good for uh, bulk ingestion, but uh, not very efficient for deleting individual records. So you usually wouldn't do that. Um, or wouldn't uh, write such a, a data that you kind of like need to. Uh, update on a per record uh, level uh, to a to a file system. However, if you uh, want to materialize such a such a result in uh, in a relational database or in a key value store like Elasticsearch, then this is much easier because um, you can um, delete individual records and uh, um, also uh, insert them. And uh, finally, there's another absurd uh, another mode, the so-called absurd mode, absurd and delete. Uh, in this case, um, this is basically uh, all the update operations are happening uh, on a on a on a key on a unique key. So each row of the output needs to have a unique key that can be used to address this record. In case of our query here, we and this is the user field because we group on user. So for every user, we get a unique. Every user has exactly one uh, one result record. And now we can basically um, update. Um, uh, we can update the result using a key, which is um, uh, more efficient because we don't, uh, depending on the system, we don't need to first delete the record and uh, uh, add it again. But instead, we can say, "Please update this record," um, and this is the new value. And for this uh, for this kind of uh, output mode, you can think of uh, writing this to something like a compacted Kafka topic. Um, Kafka has these uh, compacted topics uh, where you can uh, define a key message, and then the topic will always only store the or provide the latest value for a key, um, or again a key value store or a relational database. Let's con continue with operators in state. Um, so there is this goes now a, a little bit into the internals of, um, of of the system. So there's basically three different types of operators that Flink uh, Flink uses to process such queries. Um, there is stateless operators like filter and projection. Um, these are operators that uh, don't need to persist any intermediate results. When a filter gets a rec gets uh, gets a record, it can uh, directly make the decision um, whether this uh, record should pass or should not pass. When, it, uh, when a um, projection operator gets a row, it can immediately apply the uh, transformation that is defined in the projection and pass the row on. And once um, the row is forwarded, um, it doesn't need to remember this row anymore because it's a, it's a simple operation and uh, the operator doesn't need to have any state for that. Um, there's other operators like um, operators like aggregations or joins that need to uh, memorize uh, uh, records or intermediate results uh, because these these operators um, combine multiple records with each other, right? So an aggregation operator, um, if you have, for instance, a, a group by sum operator, it sums the values of multiple rows. So it kind of like needs to um, have um, some intermediate state to remember what uh, what the current intermediate value for the for for the sum is. Uh, a join operator joins uh, rows of different tables together. So it first needs it kind of like needs to remember the rows of the one side, and when a row comes from the other side, it kind needs to look up if there are any matching partners for uh, for this new row on the other side, and um, vice versa. This is roughly how uh, how streaming joins work. So um, a join, join, and also aggregation operators need to need to materialize uh, uh, some state internally, right? And then there is a 
And another type of uh, of operators, the so-called uh, temporal operators, which we'll discuss uh, like tomorrow. And these operators have some kind of temporal condition that um, bound the uh, uh, how to say that that bound the range of the computation. So, for instance, you can have a have a group by operation that groups uh, records that uh, arrived within 10 minutes. Um, if you do that, you know that after 10 minutes, you don't need these results anymore because you can perform the computation, uh, complete it, provide a uh, emit a result, and then the next 10 minutes start, and whatever happens, you never have to look back uh, at the at the previous 10 minutes. So uh, these operators uh, also hold some state, some intermediate state, but they're able to uh, clean up uh, this state automatically because um, there's some temporal condition that just bounds um, how long an operation needs to needs to hold the state. But as I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail tomorrow. Um, so if we look at this query again, this is the uh, this this uh, this group by query, um, then we see that um, the query here internally basically needs to hold uh, one count for every user that is being processed, right? When we uh, when when we uh, think of how the query evolved the result, um, before this record here arrived, uh, the count for Mary was two. So internally, the query had to remember for Mary the for the user Mary the current count is two, and when this the last record here arrived, uh, it said, okay, I need to count this. So counting means I have to I have seen another record for um, for Mary. I have to increment now the count for this record. Um, and then uh, it said, okay, the new count here uh, is three, and um, internally also stored this uh, this intermediate result uh, as uh, as a state, but also passed it on to the uh, to the output of the query, um, so that the query could could update the uh, result in the external system. So this query here, this simple query here, basically has three different kinds of uh, key-value pairs internally, one for uh, Mary, one for Bob, and one for Liz. Yeah, so that's basically, yeah. And uh, something that, uh, that I didn't mention yet is that the query here basically needs to hold this state forever. So there's uh, no point in time when this con query runs continuously uh, if, if you run this query for one year, for instance, then uh, the query would accumulate all unique users that uh, that were uh, um, that uh, were seen by the query, uh, because at any point in time there could be a new record coming that updated our uh, account for, for for any user. So um, this also shows that for for some of the queries you have to be not necessarily uh, careful. But you kind of like have should 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 uh, uh, think a little bit about uh, what the query would internally do, um, and then do some um, back on the napkin cal calculation whether this is something that the uh, system can handle or not. If you're just computing counts for users, then this is something that uh, is probably not too bad. Um, yeah, um, it kind of like depends. It not not. For some of the aggregations, it actually does not r only depend on the on the number of user keys, but it can also depend on the type of aggregation function that you're using. For instance, if you're using a min function or a max function, um, then it can happen that um, the state for this function is not only the uh, current minimum or maximum, but also all of the intermediate values, because if you're have if you have a, a source table that uh, might also remove some of the values, it might happen that the smallest value of the or that if you have a min function that exactly the minimum value is removed, and then you would basically need to update it to the second smallest value. And if that is again removed, you would need to update it to the third to the previously third smallest value. So, for instance, for a min or a max function. Um, it can happen that the uh, state of the aggregation function is basically one small uh, uh, data point for every record that was um, 
for, for every record of the input dynamic table. So um, yeah, so this is just a, just a summary of what I said before. Um, some of these materializing operators like aggregations and joints um, need to hold state forever because there is no temporal boundary for this uh, for this computation and um, data can change at any point in time so uh, and in order to uh, account for that you just need to have a, pro a possibly lo uh, a large amount of intermediate state um, I also said that these temporal operators can be a little bit more clever about it because um, if you if you have a temporal boundary around uh, your, uh, your 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 computation, then you also know how long you need to hold the state. And uh, once you know that you don't need the state anymore, or once you know that um, you you pass the temporal boundary, you know that you've seen all the all of the data. You can produce a result, and then also discard all of the intermediate data. So, um, but what can you do to or is is there a way that you can, how can you handle this uh, possibly growing state? So there's different types of, um, or different solutions how you, how you can do that. If you have um, some data that is growing rather slowly, like the number of users that you have, um, then you can uh, solve this problem possibly by just scaling up the query. So if uh, you run the query on two nodes, you can just scale the query possibly to three or four nodes. Um, if you have a growing number of users, then this is probably, a, first of all, a good sign. And um, you maybe you can uh, afford to run the query just on a, on a, on a larger setup. Um, if this is not the case, then you can also uh, use something that Flink calls um, uh, idle state uh, uh, cleanup. Um, and this is useful for situations like this. If your data, for instance, has some kind of session ID um, and you would like to group by the session ID, then uh, it is pretty clear from the context or from, from what we know that this session is only valid for a certain amount of time, right? Um, if the session has, is, 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 has become basically become in, inactive, uh, we know that it will not be updated at, at any point in time uh, in the future again. However, um, this is something that the uh, system that Flink doesn't really know and therefore cannot really account for. So it doesn't know that this session will not be used, uh, session ID will, will not be used again, and hence it will not automatically clean up the state. Uh, in a situation like this, you can um, configure something like this idle state cleanup. Um, and um, if you do that, uh, Flink will automatically uh, remove state that has not been accessed for a certain amount of time. And this is basically something that you can configure. If you know that a session uh, will not be used again if, if it hasn't been updated for, for an hour, for instance, you could um, set this idle state cleanup time for one or 30 minutes or two hours if you want to be on the safe side. And then uh, if it has been updated for, for two hours, Flink uh, would go ahead and remove the state for this uh, session ID. Um, this works well if the data that was removed won't be used, will, will not be used again. Um, so in that case, uh, all the computations are remain valid and everything is fine. However, if you remove some state too early, then Flink will just see the new record as something completely new and uh, will not remember that it has had done any computations for this uh, before. So at that point in time, you then would get um, uh, inconsistent results. And basically what you're doing here is you would uh, possibly trading the accuracy of the, of the result for the size of the state. Um, yeah, so to summarize, um, streams are, or uh, the input is basically interpreted as some kind of change log for a table. In the current version, Flink 1.10, we only support insert into change logs, basically change logs that represent um, only insertions. Um, in the upcoming version, where that is currently being finalized, 
uh, there will be uh, support for full change logs. Um, SQL queries that we run on a dynamic table uh, produce a new dynamic table, and um, the query kind of like de determines uh, whether the uh, result dynamic table is an append-only table or a, a table that is that is being updated. And when you convert it back, uh, there's also different modes how you can convert it a dynamic table back um, if the dynamic table is also uh, insert only. That's a fairly straightforward con uh, conversion because every record that is being inserted, conceptually inserted into the dynamic table uh, is being emitted as a new row. Um, if there is uh, upda also update and delete changes, then there is uh, different update modes uh, like insert and delete or absurd and delete um, that can be used to write the data out to uh, to an external system. Usually, you don't really um, you don't have to do that manually. When you con select a connector for a sync table, um, then the connector will basically know which kind of uh, conversions it, it it supports, and then Flink will automatically use the uh, right conversion uh, for this connector to write the data out. And if you tried, for instance, to write some some updating data to a, a Kafka topic, then Flink will simply say, no, sorry, I can't do that. Um, there's uh, no way, uh, the, the connector does not support updating uh, results, uh, updating rows in, in Kafka. Um, yeah, you can run basically uh, just regular SQL queries on these dynamic tables. Um, Ri actually writing and executing these queries is, uh, is rather easy because it's just standard SQL. However, um, you should pay some attention to the state requirements of a query and uh, depending on the query and the input data, the state might just grow uh, very large. Okay, then let's maybe have a look at the uh, <coughs> sorry at the results. So the uh, uh, first exercise was fairly simple query. We just want to basically get a histogram of uh, how many writes uh, happened with how many passengers. So if we um, remember how the uh, table uh, writes table looked like, there's this passenger count field, and uh, so we can do a simple query. Select, uh, oops, passenger count, count star from rights. Oh, I think we only wanted to have rights that started, right? So, is start. Where is start? group by passenger count. And if you run this query, you'll basically see, oh, there's even a ride with no passenger, or a couple of rides with no passengers. Um, so you basically see how the uh, result is continuously refined um, based on the data that is, uh, that, is, that is arriving. You can actually, if this is uh, going too fast, you can actually also uh, slow down the update rate a bit. So you see, oh, well, no, this way, wrong way. Let's say now we have an update every one minute. Um, so the uh, CLI client doesn't up, out update at the, fa uh, at the rate at which the query updates the result, but only update, up refreshes the page every, every one minute. So and here you can see that clearly uh, writes with a single a single passenger are clearly uh, uh, the most, followed by rides with two passengers, and so on. All right, so that's a fairly simple query, and I think the only interesting part here is that it's like continuously being uh, being updated and um, and and refined. Um, the other query was a little bit more uh, like the from the structure point of view, exactly the same. Um, in this case, we want to group the data based on the uh, hour of time and on the area ID. 
so basically um it's kind of like the kind of like very similar here um so here we group on a couple of more fields we group on this to area id function uh is start our basically uh converts the timestamp into uh only extracts the hour of day from the timestamp um we again filter on is in new york city and so on and adding a having clause and then this query ah sorry if we run this query it does exactly what we're uh, expected to do so you see here we have now we're now here at hour of day eight um simply because we got due to this uh, 10x speed we are already eight hours into the uh, um, taxi ride events all right so much for for this um then let's Yes, so the yeah, so so Andre asked the question um uh, except for table and field names, uh Flink SQL is case ins insensitive, that is uh, that is true, yeah. So uh table and field names need to be uh are case sensitive um and uh for everything else for the keywords um yeah, you can do it however you want. Okay, then let's maybe continue. How much time is left? We've got something like, I think, 25 minutes left, if I'm right. We started a bit later, or 30 minutes. Let's maybe have a look at this one. Um, this is about... Um, how you can uh, create tables, create tables in the sense of a, a DDL statement um, and connect the table to an external system. And then use this table basically also to uh, write out the que a query result to an uh, external system. So um, I did not explicitly mention this before, um, uh, but uh, Apache Flink is not a data store. So Flink does not store any data except for in-flight data that is needed to uh, for for um, query processing or uh, processing of streaming applications. So you uh, cannot use Flink as a as as, as a database to just uh, store all your data. It's uh, focusing on processing data. Uh, it stores, as I said, intermediate data that is needed for for uh, processing, but it's not a database. So whenever you're um, interacting with data, you probably read it from some external system and system. And when you're done, uh, usually you also write it out to some external system. And Flink provides connectors for many different storage systems and formats um, f for um, SQL. This is uh, Apache Kafka because it's the most uh, most widely used. Um, a stream store or system to uh, to distribute data streams. Um, it has uh, connectors for uh, JDBC. I uh, mentioned that before. Elasticsearch, uh, Apache HBase. It ha also has a good integration with Apache Hive, which is uh, mostly valuable for uh, for uh, batch query running batch queries. So you can uh, read Hive Hive tables with uh, Flink SQL and then use Flink's Flink SQL's batch engine to uh, process these. Uh, uh, these Hive tables. Um, you can write to different file systems um, and you can also write in different uh, formats uh, such as uh, Arbor, JSON, CSV, um, Parquet and ORC. There's, it's a bit of uh, um, not that easy to say which combination works how. Uh, for instance, um, 
uh, paquet or a CR of obviously file systems uh, formats that are only relevant in the context of file systems, whereas Avro, for instance, uh, Avro JSON and CSV are also relevant um, for um, instance for Apache Kafka, which uh, stores binary data that you can um, encode in whatever you w way you want. So, for instance, for Kafka, Flink SQL supports uh, uh, records that are serialized in, in Avro, JSON, or CSV. And then other systems like JDBC obviously have their own storage systems, so they don't really need to need a um, uh, Apache Avro. There is also, um, yeah, here there is this uh, link in the documentation that basically tells you like what uh, combination and which formats and um, uh, connectors are currently available for Flink SQL. Um, in the next version in Flink uh, 111, there will be um, many more connectors and uh, uh, yeah, better support for, 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 for some of the external systems. So, if you want to create a table now, you basically have to um, provide uh, different types of uh, information here. Um, first of all, um, the create uh, table statement, the DL syntax looks in the first part uh, should look familiar to you. So you uh, say create table, you give the table a name, for instance order here, and then you specify the schema of the of, of the table. And this is just a regular schema definition. So you can have an order ID, uh, give it a type uh, big end, you have an order amount, you can give it a type decimal. Flink supports all of the common commonly used um, SQL types. And then there is something like order time that is uh, of uh, type timestamp. Um, and then comes something that uh, you probably haven't seen before, which is this watermark field. Watermark for order time. You see that here again for the timestamp. And then some kind of expression, order time minus interval of 10 seconds. Um, this is a watermark definition. Uh, watermarks are Flink's um, mechanism for tracking progress and uh, time progress. Uh, as I said, we'll talk about queries in time tomorrow, so I won't go into the details here, but the important thing here is that you can um, specify the watermark expression directly within the DDL syntax. Um, it's optional, so if you don't need uh, watermarks or, or uh, time handling, then you don't, uh, don't have to uh, provide this uh, watermark uh, this watermark clause. And then the next part um, is also something that I'm uh, not sure uh, you, you might have seen before in, in other systems that, don't, that are not data stores. Um, but this is basically a definition that uh, gives all of the connector format properties that uh, Flink needs to create an appropriate connector to uh, read and write the data. So here, for instance, we're connecting to Kafka. So connector type is Kafka. It's a simple key value format. Uh, the connector version is uh, universal. That is a Flink internal thing uh, that uses the uh, yeah, Kafka's universal um, API for, for accessing uh, uh, Kafka. Uh, we obviously also need to tell the connector from which Kafka topic we want to read. This is called orders here. There's some other properties like bootstrap servers here. This is like running on my local machine. And we also want to specify format. Uh, we want to read JSON data here and um, Flink internally basically uh, from the schema definition of the table uh, can infer that uh, the, the, the JSON schema that it needs to read. So um, this is now the basically the properties that you uh, would need to um, provide to read from a, a JSON encoded Kafka topic. Obviously, if you're using uh, Avro or uh, using some other um, storage system, all these properties uh, look uh, look a bit different. Um, there's also more properties here for for Kafka. You could also specify whether you want to read from the beginning of the topic or from the end of the topic. Uh, you can provide a group ID and so on. So there's lots more, lots of more configuration. Uh, Po po or configuration options that I didn't didn't show here. Um, create table is not the only syntax that Flink supports. 
It also supports um, altering, dropping of tables, of functions, so you can uh, you use that to register your own user-defined functions. You can uh, create databases and so on. Um, and the DDL support is uh, also extended in future versions. Again, uh, Flink 1.11 will make a uh, we'll add a couple of nice features here as well. Um, internally, Flink's default catalog is not durable. So, for instance, the catalog that is used um, in the demo environment is based on the um, is, is a simple in-memory catalog that stores all the catalog data in memory, but that does not persist the the information uh, anywhere. Uh, the SQL C Light client has a has a YAML file. Where we, you can uh, specify all the all the connectors uh, properties, and when the uh, CLI client is started, this YAML file is passed, and uh, tables are created for all the entries in the YAML file. And this is basically how these three tables—the writes, the fares, and the driver changes—tables were initialized in the, in the uh, CLI client that we use for the demo environment. Um, but uh, if you would now create a new table. Uh, in the Docker container, uh, then would simply uh, stop the client and restart the client. Uh, this table would be gone. So um, by default, um, none of the catalog data is really persisted in in Flink. Flink is not is again not a data store. Uh, it doesn't store data like in, at, at some external uh, locations. Um, however, Flink supports Hive's Meta Store, so you can simply uh, connect. Um, Flink with uh, Hive Meta Store, and then use that as a uh, persistent external catalog service. Um, when you then basically connect Flink to uh, to Meta Store, you uh, create a new catalog. Uh, I call it call it HCAT or whatever. Um, and then in the Flink UI, in the Flink uh, CLI, you can say use catalog HCAT. And when you create a new table there, then this uh, table information will be persisted in Hive Meta Store. And uh, even when you then uh, stop the client and restart it again, if you again connect to HCAT, <coughs> sorry, um, then the table that you created in the previous session will, will still be there. Okay, so. Um, Writing table to uh, writing query results to external tables is a something that is very very easy. Um, just regular SQL syntax. Uh, you just use the insert into statement for that. So here's a very simple uh, simple example. Let's say we have uh, some table people um, um, that has just information about uh, persons. Uh, then we could just uh, filter or filter on the age range between uh, 10 and 20. Uh, and then write all of the data into a table called teen teenagers. Um, if you do that, then the uh, schema of the the result schema of the query must match with the table schema. So here, for instance, teenager must uh, have those two fields, name and age. Um, and uh, if uh, one of these fields is not in is not uh, available in teenager, the query will fail. And uh, Flink will say, I don't know how to write this data to teenager. Um, and also the uh, tables, the um, connector that was configured for teenage for the teenagers table needs to be able to update um, the table. Um, ba basically, uh, needs to be able to write the result table of this query um, to the external system. So, for instance, if this is a, this is a simple uh, filter query, so there should not be any issues with it. But if you if we would um, um, have a query here that produces an updating result, um, then we cannot simply write this updating result to a file system or to a Kafka topic, because the connector would not know how to forward, uh, delete, or absurd change. Um, into the um, into the sync system that holds the uh, teenager data. Let's do one more hands-on exercise. This is now uh, not the next one. It's actually the 
the last one. So if we go to the wiki page again, it's this uh, number six, creating tables and writing query results to external tables. Let's only do the Let's only do the uh, this one here, maintaining a continuously updated materials view in MySQL. The other one needs uh, the other exercise above that needs um, a temporal operator that we're just gonna discuss tomorrow. Um, so I would um, say let maybe um, let's give it five minutes or so, um, and you try to. Um, run this query. I prepared the DDL statement here for you already, so you uh, don't have to look up all of these uh, connector properties. You can simply copy-paste this for uh, for this exercise. And then there is a small uh, exercise here for, for a query that you could specify. And uh, while the query is running, you can then also look into MySQL and see how the table in MySQL is changing. Um yeah, I would say let's you can you you can try that for uh a few minutes and then we can uh go through that um together uh one more time and um I yeah point out some hopefully interesting uh, uh interesting things about this exercise. Uh, yeah, so the, the, the job keeps running when you exit the CLI. This is the uh, idea of this detached mode, exactly. So um, if you look at the, uh, in the in the Flink UI, in the Flink, Flink um, uh, web front end, you see that the job is still running. Act actually, you cannot even, maybe that's, a I guess that's a missing feature, but you cannot even cancel the job from the Flink CLI, Flink CLI anymore. You get the uh, job ID back, but um, there's currently no feature to cancel the job. You have to go into the uh, Flink UI and then uh, stop it there. All right, I think we're um, somewhat close towards the end. I would um, now go th through this exercise um, and um, show a little bit how it works, and then we can have maybe a few more questions towards the end if there is if there are any questions and um yeah all right so the um the exercise here is basically to um sorry to write the result of a of of a query to a mysql table right um the mysql table is defined by this um with this ddl statements uh, it's a simple table called area counts. Um, has two fields, area ID and account. It's backed by the uh, JDBC connector, and this is the uh, the database they connect to. It's a MySQL database. Table area counts, uh, user and password, and so on. And this is all runs in the Docker container uh, in the MySQL Docker container. So now, if you s uh, say uh, describe area counts we get uh, just the scheme information back if you now want to write into this table um, let me maybe create we can just go to the uh, uh, to another terminal and if we now connect to my SQL the table has been, or the, the MySQL table has been created before, so uh, usually you would have also go to MySQL and then um, create a table there, but uh, we already did that, so uh, there's no need to create an actual table in MySQL. So if you now uh, say, uh, oops, show tables and run this, you see there is exactly this error counts table. 
And if we say describe area counts, whoops, uh, it has exactly its um, first field is an int and the other one is a big end. Um, and this is how the table looks in MySQL. And what we did with this connector here is we basically um, create a table in the Flink catalog that is backed by the uh, table in MySQL. If you know right to this, let's maybe check what's in the table. Select uh, from area counts. Then uh, this table is empty. And if you now start a uh, static query in Flink that writes to this table, insert into area counts, um, select, what is it, Air to area ID, I hope, long lot, as area ID and count star from rights group by to area ID long lat oops lat and if you now start this query I hope it's working. Oh yeah um so now we see job ID this and um, there seems to be something running. If we select now here, we see that there are uh, a couple of rows inserted into this table. And uh, it also seems that this data is uh, changing. And it's changing because Flink uh, automatically uh, writes the result of, the, of this uh, group query that we started into, uh, into MySQL. And we can now also look how the query looks like if we connect to um, to the Flink web UI. And we see that this query here is running. And it's exactly the query that uh, I just wrote. Insert into area counts, select to area ID, and so on. We can look at the query, get the query plan here. It's a simple query, runs with a parallelism of one. We have here, um, this is, Flink tries to get as much uh, computation as possible into a into a processing node. So this is actually the source node. It's a, a projection down to only the fields that we read. Um, and if we would have added a filter, also the filter would have been in here. Um, and then it does a hash partitioning here. Okay, hash partitioning with a parallelism of one doesn't really make sense, but imagine it would be like 10 or so. Um, and then there's a group aggregate here that uh, does the group by on the area ID, um, the count, and uh, the um, writing to the flink, to writing the data to the to the to the sync. Um, you can see here how many records have been uh, received and produced. And let me see if the query is running with checkpoints. It's not running with checkpoints. So um, if we would have configured the see like that, maybe we should do that in the future, uh, to have checkpointing enabled, then the query would also be checkpointed as a reg just like a regular Flink job. So um, if you have some experience with Flink before, checkpoints are Flink's mechanism to um, for a fault tolerance. So you can think of it as basically that Flink periodically takes a, a snapshot of all state in the f in the f uh, of the job, writes the state into a distributed uh, persistent durable storage like uh, S3 or HDFS. And uh, then if some failure happens, the whole job gets, uh, um, the, 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 the checkpoint is uh, taken to uh, reinitialize uh, a new job. And since we did a copy of everything, uh, the job then looks exactly the same when it continues, looks exactly the same. Um, as uh, as at the point in time when the checkpoint was taken, and um, if you use transactional syncs, then actually um, the whole behavior is as if nothing ever happened. So even even if you had a failure, uh, you will not see anything in your output or in your state. Everything will be um, absolutely consistent. 
All right, so this is basically now the query that we're running. Um, as I said before, we cannot even change it, cancel the query here from the Flink CLI. So we have to do it from the dashboard. Uh, we just go here, can click on cancel, cancel the job, yes. Come on. Now the job has been canceled and also, yeah, okay, it's, it's a bit hard now to see, but uh, there are no more updates here on the, on the on the table in MySQL. And obviously, you could now also um, uh, query this MySQL table from some some other um, from th from some other application or with a dashboarding uh, uh, application. And uh, since the table is updated uh, pretty much uh, in real well, not exactly real time, but with very low latency. Um, you can um, you can get then the application that reads from the MySQL table uh, always gets the freshest results.